Hey, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist Ministries. We are coming to you again from the Midwest where I am out on a preaching trip. I was recently confronted with a situation um, that's not uncommon in Christian circles today. And it had to do with the doctrine of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Um, you know, most of what Christianity believes about this subject is the doctrines created by the Roman Catholic Church, and they don't really know what the Bible says on the subject. So let's just do a deep dive today. Clean the slate, if you will. Don't come with the preconceived Roman Catholic teaching on it, and let's just go in and see what the Bible says. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your word, which just sheds light, leaves nothing to doubt, our final authority, regardless of what anybody teaches in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. So uh, the, the basic premise of this is uh, there is a misunderstanding of what a marriage is. So that's what we have to define first is exactly what is a marriage. Now, your Roman Catholic teaching is that marriage is a ceremony sanctioned by the church and performed by a priest. That, that is what most people think of when they think of marriage. They think of a ceremony, and then, of course, the other side of this would be a legal document document sanctioned by the king or by the government or by the authorities, a, a civil contract. So there, there was the, um, the, the spiritual side and the civil side to it. But did you know that nowhere in your Old Testament or your New Testament will you find either of those things in relation to what a marriage is. Yep, there's no ring. There's no priest or preacher. There's, there, there is no piece of paper. Uh, there is no ceremony nowhere in the Bible. This is a Roman Catholic teaching. This is one of seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church was the Roman Catholic Church sacrament of marriage performed by a priest. This is not biblical. However, many Christians, Protestants, uh, fundamental Baptists, all still go by the preconceived definition set by the Roman Catholic Church. All right. So first of all, <laughs> we have to uh, define what a marriage is. Amen. And you will find that way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter two with the first marriage. We always, we always like to do first mention. Amen. God, God sets the tones, basic meanings and associations of a thing when he first mentions it in the scripture. Genesis two and We'll start uh, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto man. And man said, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Here's your, here's your verse. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother 
and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. See, that's the definition of a marriage, is when the two become one flesh. We see this verse uh, mostly, in one sense, partially repeated and quoted, but we'll see it five times. Uh, we'll go to first Malachi chapter two. And uh, 15. Malachi 2.15. God says, and did not he make one? That's, that's the quote there. He did not he make one. Yet had he the residue of the spirit? And wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed. Amen. So he, he's in the whole context of that. He says back in verse 14. Yet ye say wherefore because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. And in verse 15 he said did not he make one. Make the two one. And then we go to uh, Matthew chapter 19. Verses four through six. Got to understand, before we can understand about marriage and divorce and whatnot, we gotta understand what a marriage is. Amen. Okay, Matthew nineteen, and I think we can read like four through six. Matthew nineteen, and uh, we'll go back a little bit. It's verse three. So the Pharisees, they're coming to Jesus, the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? All right. And he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and they shall and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are now no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. He quotes that there. And uh, we'll read some more of this later in this later in this lesson. We'll be coming back here. But for right now, that's what we were looking at. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. He says the same thing. From the beginning of the creation, God then meant male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the twain shall be the twain shall be one flesh. So they are no more twain, but one flesh. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And then we go to First Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six, and we'll look at verses sixteen. And 17, he says this. Well, I'll go back to 15. He says, know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body for two saith he shall be one flesh amen to get in the context god is defining what marriage is marriage is in its essence it's more than that but in its essence the marriage is the joining of the flesh ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. 
We can, uh, we can back up to uh, verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and the two shall be one flesh. So the biblical definition of a marriage is a man and a woman come together and they join, they join flesh in, 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 the, in the act and when they do that, they are supposed to dwell, therefore, afterwards, as man and wife. So what is fornication? Fornication is unmarried people coming together and joining flesh and then not remaining together and dwelling as man and wife. That's fornication. What is adultery? Adultery is married people joining in flesh with somebody else that they have committed fornication, fornication and adultery. Amen. So married. All right. Uh, the first mention is in Genesis 38, 8. What does it mean to be married? First mention, the law of first mention, sets the basic tones, association, and meaning throughout the rest of Scripture. All right? So God tells Onan, he says, Judah, or Judah said to Onan, go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. Okay? When he went in, to, he told her, go in to her and marry her. When he went into that tent and lie with her to raise up seed to his brother, that performed the marriage. That's what marriage is biblically, is flesh joining to flesh. Um, now, the Roman Catholic teaching is that it is a ceremony to be presided over by the church. Marriage is, as I said, one of seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. The custom of a ceremony done by a religious leader is wholly of Catholic origin and not scriptural. You will find no case anywhere in your Old Testament of a priest overseeing a wedding ceremony or uh, in the New Testament of a pastor, bishop, elder overseeing a wedding ceremony. Uh, there's no government official conducting or validating a marriage ceremony in the Old Testament or the New Testament. You will see that there are weddings, this wedding, but that, that is just a feast. That is just a celebration of the marriage, the wedding, the feast, that is not the marriage. The marriage is when the two flesh come together. Um, you will find, what you find in the Old Testament is that all instructions, commandments, and charges regarding marriage are given to the parents, not to the priest, not to the government. Uh, it was all given to the parents in the family unit over their children. All right, so uh, let's go in and we'll, uh, uh, we'll do a little, uh, we'll do a little examination of a couple, of a couple things. Um, let's go over to 1 Corinthians. And we'll touch on this a couple of times. I wanna just show you some defining the terminology that uh, the Roman Catholic teaching 
misses. Amen. First Corinthians, let's go to chapter seven. First Corinthians chapter seven. All right. Now, uh, let's look at verse 34, seven and 34. Here he's talking about a virgin. He says, there's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman, okay, that's the virgin, all right? God, Paul, Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, calls the virgin unmarried woman. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit, but she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So I want to... I want to key in on the on the word there, unmarried. Now, look over in the same chapter in verse 11. Start in verse 10. But unto the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she departs, let her remain unmarried. You see that? God calls the divorced woman unmarried. Because a divorce ends a marriage. When a woman divorces her husband, she then becomes unmarried. And that's what God said. Read it again. But if she depart, let her remain. What is she? Unmarried. Because what? Flesh has left flesh. That, that has broken the covenant. Amen? So unmarried in here means virgin, and it also means divorced. You see it in the text right there. All right. So think about this in John chapter 4. The woman at the well. Amen? John chapter 4. Verses, let's see. Sixteen. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Okay? Jesus says, Agrees with her. She does not at this time, when he's talking to her, she is unmarried. Thou hast no husband. Amen. Verse 18. For thou hast in the past, <laughs> hast had five husbands. You have had five husbands. And whom thou now hast, is not thy husband. He said, in that, thou said truly. He said, you, you spoke the truth. You've had five husbands. And that dude that you're messing with now, he's not your husband. And you know why he wasn't her husband? Because she was an adulteress. He was married to somebody else, right? So he was married to somebody else and she was fornicating with him. So she was fornicating with somebody else's husband. This guy was two-timing. <laughs> he was a polygamist, if you will. He had his wife at home and he was messing with her. Because he still had his wife at home, she was not his wife. Had nothing to do with the ceremony. So uh, marriages and divorces, they were legal under the law. Or she would have been stoned. She said, you've had five husbands. Deuteronomy 22, 22 says, if a woman's taken in adultery, you stone her. Well, she's not getting stoned. Why? Because her divorces were the divorces. And we'll see that when we get over here into, uh, uh, into Matthew chapter 19, the, uh, under Jewish law, where Moses made allowance 
for the divorces. He gave the grounds for divorces and he told why he did it. Uh, so here's a, here's a lady that had had five, has five husbands uh, um, and the Lord recognizes that she is unmarried. She has no husband, but that she did have five husbands. That's the Lord Jesus Christ going along with her. So uh, that puts to bed the teaching that once you're married to someone, you can never divorce them. Uh, once you divorce someone, they are, are no longer considered your spouse. So that's, uh, yeah, that's over with. And if you do, you divorce somebody, they're not your spouse anymore. And then you become unmarried. You're not married to them anymore. You're unmarried. Amen. So uh, then you, you get over there into uh, um, the one that uh, most of your fundamental Baptists really get hung up on as the, for the qualifications uh, in, in ministry. And uh, of course, uh, uh, that is over in Timothy. First Timothy three. So we look over here and they, this is where they, you know, this is what we call reading something into the text that isn't there. All right. And, and we'll, de we'll, de we'll demonstrate that. Uh, first Timothy three, two. A bishop then must be blameless the husband of one wife. Okay. Got to be the husband of one wife. All right. So does that mean that a single man can't be, a, can't be a bishop or pastor, deacon, whatever a single man can't be, a, can't be. All right. Well, that, that's, that's the way we got to go. What about, and they'll say, uh, or a divorced man. And they'll say, nope. Nope, not they'll say not a divorced man because he already has a wife, and it, it, that, and the one he divorced still counts as his wife. Uh, so nope, nope, he can't because he because he has two wives. All right, well, what about a man who is a widower? Say he a man's in the ministry and his wife dies, and he marries somebody else. Uh, now now he's had two wives. It's simple math. It's simple math. They say, well, no, no. They said that, that that first one don't count because she died. <laughs> All right. And this is where they get themselves in trouble. Now, now you're talking about grounds for divorce. And remember, divorce isn't a piece of paper issued by the government. A divorce, as in marriage, is flesh joining to flesh. A divorce, a putting away, is flesh leaving flesh. So when flesh leaves flesh, that is divorce. Death is a divorce. Death is actually God divorcing. That's flesh leaving flesh because of death. That's not the only grounds for divorce that the scripture gives us. Um, this verse had to do with polygamy, all right? If you do any historical reading at all and get the context on what was going on here in Israel during that period of time, then you understand what was going on. I'll just give you a couple things real quick. Um, Josephus, the historian that writes of the era, he was born in 37 AD. He said that King Herod had nine wives. All right. Polygamy. All right. Then we come along one six, uh, uh, Justin Martyr, one of the early church fathers. He was, he, he died in 165 AD and he wrote, uh, he reproaches the Jews of them having four or five wives. So we see that, that this was polygamy was a common practice uh, in, in the region at the time. And uh, uh, it wasn't until about 1000 AD uh, that polygamy was formally forbidden among the Jewish people. And 
And it continued in Muslim lands, even among the Jews, until about 1929. He gives some historical context. He's telling what he's telling them here. You, you, have the, you just have one wife, not four, five, nine. He's talking about one wife at a time, taking into context everything else that the scripture says about divorce. Amen. So we go on. Uh, flesh. The essence of marriage is flesh joining flesh. Flesh. The essence of a divorce is flesh leaving flesh. So now let's look at Matthew chapter 19 with some context so that we understand the terminology. Okay, we'll go. All right. Um, verse three, the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Well, they're asking him that because in the law, in the Jewish Old Testament law, it was real easy. He, Moses gave him that bill of divorcement and, and a man could, it's, just, there, it's in there. It says, it just if she don't please you, you find some uncleanness in her, you can divorce her. So that's what that was in the Mosaic law for the Jews was uh, a, a man could divorce his wife for any cause. That's why he asked him that question. He says, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh, and what therefore God hath joined together, let none, let not man put asunder. We're coming back to that. Don't worry. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement? Why was divorce put in there as an option? All right. And to put her away. He said, well, why did Moses let us do it? Why does the Old Testament, why does the law, why does the law allow this to happen? Verse eight, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. He said, from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And he gives us here a little explanation. He said, look, because of your hardness of your hearts, because you're fallible, sinful human beings, God knew that sometimes people were going to blow it. Sometimes things weren't going to, weren't going to go right. Sometimes people weren't going to get along. Sometimes people got divorces. People were going to separate. They were going to what? They were going to leave each other. They were going to, they were going to separate and break the marriage, which is what flesh joining flesh. The people, the twain would come apart. They would not dwell together. They would not lie together. They're going their separate ways. And he said, because of that, he's going to give you an allowance, a writ of divorcement or else what? They'd be adulterers and they'd have to be stoned if he didn't give them the writing of divorcement. And that's just, and, and the same principle comes over into the New Testament. He said it was not so from the beginning. Yes, divorce is not good. Uh, the ideal is that people come together as one, dwell together as one, and stay together as one. That is the original ideal. But that doesn't always happen. And because that doesn't always happen, God has given us allowances and a plan B in there where people can still be restored and used of God and, and go on. And, uh, and we'll, we're going to get into more of that here uh, in, in just a minute. Okay, three. Okay, um, so 
Now let's look at these grounds for divorce. Amen. Um, first of all, the one we just read here, except it be for fornication. See, why fornication, right? Well, this goes back to the verse, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, okay? Well, he's telling you right there that a man can put it asunder, all right? And how does a man put it asunder? Well, what happens is when one of the members that has become one goes and joins flesh, fornication, that's the context of the passage, when, when one of the members goes and lies with someone else, that breaks the marriage. And they and and that gives they don't have they don't have to divorce, but it gives the grounds and the right on the offended party to say that that joining of flesh with that other individual that broke our one flesh. Now hey, what does God say about it? tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Hey, that's the ideal. I mean, even if they step out, look, bring it back, bring it back together, forgive. But it's at that point in time that that that, that thing's broken. That thing is broken because of fornication. Amen. That's not the only grounds. Uh, Romans chapter seven, verse three. Romans 7 and verse 3. Know ye not, start in verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that what know the law. All right, we're speaking about Old Testament law, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that hath, that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth, for the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Read over it real quick. You've got the Roman Catholic interpretation in your head. You didn't hear what he said. He said, for the woman which what? Look at that. Verse two, for the woman which hath a husband. Hath, okay? That's, that's present tense. He's still her husband. There's been no stepping out. There's been no fornication. Flesh hasn't left flesh. They're still married. There hasn't been someone come in, interpose, and join flesh, right? No man has put them asunder. They are still married, all right? So if while she's still married, see, then she marries another, then, then she's a polygamist. See what I'm saying? She hasn't divorced the first husband because which hath a husband. Present tense, hath, ongoing. It's not, it didn't say for a woman which had a husband, is bound by the law of the husband as long as he lived. No, one who is still married. This is talking about a woman who has not been divorced and goes and gets with somebody else. Uh, and notice what it said, for the woman which hath a husband is bound, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. What? The law binds you. Binds as long as there is the marriage. The divorce breaks the marriage. But notice that word bound, okay? When there's been no divorce, flesh hasn't left flesh. They are bound, all right? And then look at the third ground for divorce. 1 Corinthians 7.15. And we'll park over here a little bit because there's a lot of a lot of good stuff right here that brings a lot of context and explains the plan B very clearly. 
Amen. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and look at verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, that's desertion, okay? That's flesh leaving flesh. Unbelieving departs. Bye. Flesh is, flesh is broken with flesh. Flesh is gone. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. The brother or sister is what? Not under bondage in such cases. They're no longer bound. No longer bound by the law in the situation where one of them departs. Exactly the same as it says, if the husband be dead, she's no longer bound. Here it says, if the unbelieving depart, she's no longer bound. That's it's just 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 as clear as can be. Uh, so we get to look at verse 27. So the unbelieving is departed, right? They're no longer bound. Look at verse 27. Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. That's the ideal. Look at verse 28. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. He's saying, have you been, have you been loosed? Have you had a divorce? Well, it's best, he said, it's best if you remain just as I and just focus on the things of God. But what did he go else did he go on to say? Listen, it's better to marry than to burn. Paul said, if, you, if they cannot contain, he says, let them marry. See, that's what, that's, that's what this whole thing, that's what this whole thing is in for. This, 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 this exception, this exception to the rule, the same way it was there in the Old Testament, it's there the same way in the New Testament. Marriage is not a ceremony, it's not a ring, it's not a piece of paper, <clears throat> it's flesh, <clears throat> flesh joining flesh. And when another person comes in and joins flesh with one of the parties, that's fornication, except for fornication, that breaks the contract, <clears throat> that makes divorce legal in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. If one of the parties dies, that severs flesh from flesh, that frees the other party he says the same thing to the widows. It's best if you remain unmarried, but if you can't contain, go ahead and marry. Same instructions, same instructions to the widow as to those that had a divorce because of fornication and for those who had a divorce because of divert, because of desertion. All, all those contingencies are in there because the God, God is a God of restoration and fixing things and putting things right. And if you've been through, if you've been through one of those situations in your life, hey, whether you were the guilty party or they were the guilty party, uh, you know, praise God in, in this age, in this dispensation, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. This, this, Divorce isn't an unforgivable sin that the blood of Jesus doesn't wash away. <clears throat> when, when we blow it, when we make mistakes in our life, that doesn't, that doesn't make us a, 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 a castaway or, or, or a failure or an outcast or unusable. No, it's only as long as we haven't repented of that thing and, and, and got that right with our father. Babe, once we get that thing right, man, that, that hey, it's it's gone as far as the east is from the east is from the west, thrown in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. So the uh, the scripture is real clear in the Old Testament and the New Testament about exactly what a marriage is and what breaks a marriage, and the situations in which God allows a divorce, and in the context of Matthew 19, and in the context of Romans chapters, Matthew 19 with fornication, and in the context of Romans 7 with death, and in the context 
of 1 Corinthians. Remarriage is in the context of each of those three grounds for divorce. Because what did he say? Verse 28, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Don't be under the religious, pharisaical, legalistic bondage of a Catholic sacramental doctrine that is not in the word of God. So there's a lot of good, good folks whose ministry and lives have been destroyed because of that Catholic teaching where they sit them down, take them off the battlefield, shut them up and shun them because of a Roman Catholic teaching that was not in this book. A lot of, a lot of great men of God down through the ages have had wives leave them. They didn't want to be part of their ministry. And I'll, I'll close with this. That Roman Catholic doctrine that says that a divorced man can't be a pastor, it puts the woman in charge of his ministry. How, you say? Well, you've got a man who's got a ministry. He's a pastor, preacher. He's doing God's work. And, and he's got a wife that's not on board. He's got a wife that's worldly. He's got a wife that doesn't want to do all this ministry stuff. And you know what she can tell him? You do what I say or I'll leave you and you're out of the ministry, pal. Puts the woman in charge of the whole thing. That's not God's program. That's a twisting from the Roman Catholic doctrine that marriage is a sacrament and a ceremony. Marriage is flesh joining flesh. That's the essence of it. And the divorce is flesh leaving flesh. That's the essence, essence of it in God's word, not in man's tradition. Amen. Hope that blesses somebody out there. God still wants to use you. And, 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 and there's no glass ceilings either. Amen. And so, hey, be all you can be in the Lord and know the past is gone and under the blood and get out there and preach the gospel with all your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.